Good evening. I'm Pam Cosby Brandman, and my talk tonight is called Basking in Your Love. When I ask myself what is the most important thing in the world, it has to be love, which is another name for God. One of the most sacred times in my life, when I was taking care of my first husband, Patrick, before he passed away from cancer in 2002. He was very intelligent. He loved to talk, debate, really. Um, he would take the devil's advocate position just to see what people were thinking. As he neared death, however, his, um, the cancer spread to his brain. And so his sentences got shorter, and he started mixing up the words. Well, it was, I would come home from work during that period of time, and I would make his lunch. So I came home one day, made his lunch, and carried it upstairs, put the tray over top of him in bed, and sat down next to him to spend some time together. I started chatting merrily away about my day, and then I looked at him and saw this mysterious smile. I asked him, what are you thinking? And his smile got a little bigger. And I said, no, really, tell me what you're thinking. Trying to draw him out. And his smile just got bigger. And his face started beaming with this Buddha-like smile. And so we sat there together in the quiet and the stillness, just being together. I was still intrigued and asked him again, Really, what are you thinking? And he looked me straight in the eye, and he said, I'm basking in your love. That was a very special moment for me. I'll never forget it. It's given me a lot of strength through the years. Now, a few days later, Patrick asked me, what are you learning from this experience? Now, he was still worrying about me through all of his challenges. But I quickly answered, love is all there is. You see that in all the dashing around we did to the doctors, and I went to work, I was taking care of the children, taking care of my husband, the only thing that mattered, the only thing that would last from it all, was love. Now, Patrick knew this as well. When he was living... He had always felt that he wasn't really loved by anyone, including me. And when he, um, he never felt that he was good enough. And so he, um, when he had to slow down and be still, and just his intellect was not there, he just had to be, he finally got it. He realized that he was truly loved by me and by God and by so many people in his life. This is what he had been looking for his whole life. And that is when he let go of his more than five-year battle with cancer and passed away. He had found what he had been seeking his whole life to be loved. And he and I both discovered that love is all there is. Now in the Gospel of Mark, the, um, in the New Testament, the teacher Jesus was asked by someone, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus replied, it is that the Lord is one. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind. And the second is this. Love thy neighbor as, their self, as thyself. There was no greater commandment. Now, Ernest Holmes commented on these two great commandments in the Science of Mind textbook. He says, the two great commandments are to love God and our brother man. On these hang all the law and the prophets. Love is a complete, complete unity with life, and we cannot enter this state unless we are in unity with all that lives, for all life is one. To love God 
alone is not enough, for this would exclude our fellow man. To love our fellow man alone is not sufficient, for this would be too limited a concept of God. When we realize that God and man are one and not two, we shall love both. We shall love man as an expression of God and God as the life principle and all. Now, there have been many writers and philosophers who have written about what is love. My favorite is a Frenchman named Antoine de saint exupéry And published in 1943, he wrote a book called The Little Prince. I read it the first time in fifth grade French class in French. But this beloved children's book for adults is loved around the world and translated into 253 languages and dialects. The most recent version is a 2015 movie called The Little Prince, and you can watch it on Netflix. I really recommend that you watch it. Now, one of the characters, the fox, says to the little prince, what is essential is invisible to the eye. It can only be seen with the heart. Beyond appearances, beyond everything, every being concealed within is a treasure a mystery that must be discovered. This is the spirit within. Now, the prince learned about love by caring for this beautiful rose that was on his planet. And so by admiring and spending time with his rose, by caring for it and watering it, he learned that his rose was unique to all the other roses in the entire universe. He even protected it when he left his planet by covering it with a clear glass vase that protected it. You see, he had tamed her and thereby become responsible for her. He had discovered her inner spirit, and she had tamed him. Now, humans are naturally wired to care, to tame each other. It's in our DNA as a species. Learning how to care, like swimming is easy for some people. It's as easy and natural as breathing or walking. Once we learn to care, we don't want to stop. The joy of loving and being loved is immeasurable. The care is about God as us, loving the God and everyone as one, just in the two greatest commandments. My mother likes to tell a story from her early childhood. She heard her younger sister, Joyce, who was just a little over a year old, in her crib crying because she was teething. And so Lila did what any smart, almost three-year-old would do. She went down to the kitchen, opened up the big jar of home-cured dill pickles, took out a big, juicy pickle, and ran down the hallway, pickle juice spilling everywhere, and threw the pickle into the crib with her sister. Lila stood back, very proud of her accomplishment. And then her mother, hearing all the commotion, came down the hall and said, what are you doing? And Lila said, well, Joyce's teeth hurt, so I gave her a pickle to chew on. Mother was not happy and took that pickle out of the crib. But Lila knew that she naturally knew how to love and care for his sister. Now, some people learning to swim and learning to care is very difficult, scary, and foreign, especially if they've never experienced care and safety or love and nurturing. They avoid being vulnerable and needy at all costs. But those caring muscles are still there, waiting to be exercised and developed, and hopefully used to love and care for themselves and for others. Now, small groups create a safe space to learn to love and to care for each other. It is a safe place to let down our shields and practice using those muscles. Together, we learn to co-create deep personal connections. We learn to heal any sense of separation from each other or from spirit. We realize that we are not alone. We understand and experience what it means to say, 
I see you. I appreciate you. I love you. You are a part of me. We are here for each other. You see, some of the time, we will be the ones doing the caring. And some of the times, we will be the one receiving the caring. It's a proven principle of group dynamics that intimacy and caring, carrying um, happen most easily in a groups of 10 or less. Why is this? Well, Carl George, George, who is one of the gurus on small groups and church growth, says in his book, Prepare Your Church for the Future, the key to caring in small groups is the activity of listening. People don't feel cared for unless someone has heard them. So how does this work? Well, if there's two people, I signal you, and you signal me back. Pretty easy. But if there's three people, I'm listening to your signal, but I'm also listening to the signal from person number three, and I'm listening to the signals between two and three. Now, this is the same for person two and for person three, so a total of nine signals. If there's four people, it's 28 signals. When it gets up to 10 people, those signals have multiplied to 5,110 signals. Now, this shows you why in a large group, perhaps like a Sunday service, the kinds of relationships we develop amidst all that commotion are more superficial. We develop acquaintances rather than deep friendships. In small groups, we have a chance to, be, to develop some close, intimate relationships to, that are in much more depth than those superficial ones on Sunday. We have a chance to do this through listening, by caring, and by belonging together. Here at InSpirit, we are in the midst of training and planning for our small groups program, which is going to be beginning in June. It is called the Community First Program, and we're being mentored by Reverend Mark Anthony Lord, who pioneered small groups with the CSLs at the Bodhi Center he founded in Chicago. Now, small groups programs have been used by Christian churches for many decades to build strong and growing communities. It's the secret of the Saddleback Church, which we have here in Orange County. The North Hollywood Center for Spiritual Living with Reverend Mark Vieira has a vibrant home groups program. Although they keep adding small groups, they still have a waiting list of people wanting to get in. Now here at InSpirit, we have had a successful home groups program in the fall every year where for five weeks. We meet together in people's homes as a part of our Venture in Spirit program. We've had many requests that those groups would continue meeting throughout the year. And now the home groups will meet once a month all year round. The um, people will be connected into groups and organically around their infinity groups. So it could be women, men, mixed groups, parents, youth, couples, maybe from the LBGTQ community, neighbors that live nearby. Could be your desire for a day group or a night group. Or perhaps you want to meet at the center or in someone's home. Whatever the various affinities are that will bring people together. Now, each home group will start as a small group of five to six members with two co-leaders and then gradually grow. I am really proud and grateful for our leaders that we have here at the InSpirit Center. They have really stepped up. They've completed six weeks of in-depth training, and they're working hard to plan and prepare for our programs, which start next week. They are supported by our four leader champions, our program director, and by our senior minister, Reverend Sandy. They will all support us as we work our way and navigate through the home group program. Now, the home group's format will be similar to what you remember from the fall programs if you attended that. They start with a time for social interaction, perhaps with some food and getting to know each other. There is always spiritual practice and time to learn and discuss something new. And finally, we always have time to support each other with prayer, love, and caring. In small groups, through acts of kindness and caring, listening and sharing, we build a community and care structure that will support each one of us 
to become that individual that God created us to be and make a difference in the world. We will also create a care structure that will support us as we take turns being that person during a time of, that needs support during a time of illness or confusion, perhaps grieving or radical change. With open hearts and minds, we will love and care for each other. So get ready. Make sure that you are here next week because it'll be your first opportunity to sign up for that home group that's most interesting to you. You will have a chance to exercise those muscles to love and care for each other and for yourself. Share your spirit with some friends, old and new. Discover that magnificent spirit within the, each member of your home group. We will tame each other in a safe, caring, and spiritual environment. We will be basking in each other's love. I love you all.